Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Uh, today, I'll be discussing the first galaxies and reionization. Uh, and let me start with a slide that I showed briefly uh, in the first lecture. It shows uh, the observable universe. We are situated here at the center, and we are looking out into space. And we can see all the way out to the distance that photons have traveled since the Big Bang. Um, this diagram is shown in co-moving coordinates, which I defined yesterday, just to remind you, um, it's the distance of a given force today from us. So uh, actually, the distance of uh, the Big Bang surface around us is not 13.7 billion light years away because during the time that the photons traveled to us, the universe expanded. So there is the scale factor that you need to include in calculating the co-moving distance. But uh, this is the largest distance that we can probe. And we have a finite volume that we can observe. We can't tell what is going on beyond this uh, spherical volume. And I've marked here the surfaces of different redshifts. Again, uh, the distances here are in co-moving coordinates. And, um, this is at the surface of redshift 1, redshift 2, redshift 5. And actually, redshift 5 marks, roughly speaking, half of the observable volume of the universe. So if you go to redshifts beyond 5, uh, you are probing uh, a substantial portion of, of the available volume of the universe. The reason is that volume goes like distance cubed. And I made this. Uh, nice diagram for my book, the book that I published two years ago, and I'll show a slide of it in a minute. And I thought that was very original. It's a picture that we can draw now that we have a standard model of cosmology. But uh, on Sunday, I visited the, uh, the cemetery in Pisa uh, and saw a fresco from the 14th uh, <coughs> century, which looks very much like it. And uh, the title of it is The Universe. And so uh, even though it's not a PowerPoint slide, it looks very similar. There is one difference that I noticed. Uh, there is a person, or I should say, there is someone holding it all together. Uh, and that is not included in the standard model of cosmology. But it's remarkable that this uh, visual uh, existed already in the 14th century. We just filled it up with details. Um, so coming back to the modern picture, uh, at redshifts above 10, that's the time when the hydrogen that was left behind um, following 400,000 years after the Big Bang uh, cosmological recombination took place and then hydrogen filled up the universe. Uh, this hydrogen was ionized by the first generation of stars that I'll be focusing on today. And the process uh, completed by a redshift of five and it was uh, almost done uh, around redshift 10. So. Um, somewhere between uh, redshift 50 and redshift uh, 5 is when uh, stars and black holes were responsible for ionizing the universe. And the interesting point is that redshifts above 5 contain most of the co-moving volume of the universe. Now, why is that important? Uh, because if we want to figure out the initial conditions that the universe started with after inflation, uh, what we would like to find is the largest number of independent regions that sample those initial conditions. And so how do we do this calculation? This is based on a paper that I published uh, a few months ago. Um, the idea is that we consider the density field, which we write as the over density that I defined yesterday, delta, as a function of position. And we can take the Fourier transform of that. And then we are talking about modes. So a given k mode, labeled by the wave number k, which is 2 pi over the wavelength. And in order to find the amplitude of uh, k modes, the characteristic amplitude left behind after inflation, this, this was the amplitude of the initial uh, density field on the scale defined by the wavelength lambda. In order to measure it, you need to have a large enough samples of this mode uh, within the observed uh, universe. And so uh, the, what you care about is uh, the power spectrum, which is uh, the absolute value of the amplitude, which is a complex number, uh, squared, and sample averaged over the universe. 
So if you have a certain volume of the universe that you are surveying, um, you want to know how many regions of size lambda you can fit within this uh, survey volume. And given the number of such independent that you find within your survey volume, uh, the statistical uncertainty is simply given by Poisson statistics as one over the square root of this number of independent regions. So the uncertainty in the amplitude of density perturbation, so the uncertainty in the power spectrum over the power spectrum is related to one over the square root of the number of independent regions that you can fit within your survey volume. And to count how many such independent regions uh, you simply take the volume that you are serving divided by the characteristic volume associated with a wavelength lambda. Or in other words, what you care about is uh, k squared dk, the volume in k space, times the volume in real space. That gives you the number of independent regions that you're probing. And you can ask, what is the volume that I can probe in the universe if I go out to a certain redshift z? And of course, this volume as you go to higher redshifts. But at a redshift of, for example, 0.3, which defines the limit of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the first incarnation of the Sloan Digital, Digital Sky Survey that mapped the distribution of galaxies, that corresponds to only a tenth of a percent of the total observable volume of the universe. So uh, up till um, a few years ago, all the data that we had about the distribution of matter covered a tiny fraction of the observable volume of the universe in co-moving coordinates. And so that's very important because we can improve dramatically the statistical uncertainty uh, by, by surveying a bigger volume of the universe. Now the microwave background also gives us a measure of different uh, K modes, but the microwave background comes to us from a surface, a two-dimensional surface, uh, which is uh, shown as the edge of this uh, black region. Um, and the black region defines the, the time during which the universe was opaque, so we can't really see through it. All we see is the last scattering surface of the cosmic microwave background when the hydrogen formed and the free electrons were not able to scatter the microwave photons anymore. Uh, and so what we see is this photosphere, spherical photosphere around us, which is similar to the photosphere of the sun. We see only the edge the outer surface of the opaque region that we are looking at. And therefore, we can constrain the amplitude of perturbations on a two-dimensional surface, not on a three-dimensional surface, volume. And so because of that, we are quite limited in terms of the number of independent regions that we can fit on the sky, on a two-dimensional surface. So the microwave background, even though it's the Rosetta Stone to infer the initial conditions of the universe that has been used a lot in the literature, in, statistically speaking, it's a very limited data set because it covers only a two-dimensional surface around us. And what we really want is to uh, survey a three-dimensional volume of the universe because then we get many more independent regions for any given K-mode. Uh, and, for example, you can plot the distance out to which, the co-moving distance out to which we can uh, do a survey at different redshifts. Or here I show the scale factor, the log logarithm of the scale factor, which is over 1 plus z. Um, and it turns out that if you were a cosmologist at different redshifts, you would be able to probe different volumes, of course. So you, you may ask, when is the best time to be a cosmologist? Is it early in the universe, late in the universe? Uh, and what I show here is the co-moving distance of the horizon, the distance out to which you can do a survey at any given redshift or scale factor. And the present time is, of course, uh, here by a equal 1 or the log of a equals 0. And that, coincidentally, is uh, very close to the peak of the largest uh, volume that we can probe, just because the cosmological constant is starting to take over now. And in the future, when the cosmological constant dominates, the co-moving distance to the horizon actually shrinks. So we will see less and less, simply because the physical wavelengths will be stretched so much that they will exit from the horizon. So if you consider a mode of a wavelength lambda, 
the mode enters the horizon at some redshift, and then it will exit in the future simply because it will be stretched so much that it will exceed the size of the observable universe. And so there is a finite amount of time during which we can actually probe any wavelength lambda. And it's an interesting question to ask, when is the best time to do cosmology? So I just counted modes, and what you need to know is what is the maximum wave number that you can probe, and what is the minimum wave number that you can probe. Uh, and of course, the wave number is 2 pi over the wavelength. And so what is the shortest wavelength that you can be sensitive to? That is dictated by the scale of objects that are made in the universe. Because once you make an object, you lose memory of the initial conditions. So when you make galaxies, you are not able to recover the initial conditions of the density field because the matter that makes the galaxy gets mixed up. And you lose memory of uh, the linear regime of density perturbation. So you want to avoid <laughs> wavelengths that are shorter than the scale that collapses at, at any given redshift. Uh, and the largest scale that you can probe is, of course, the horizon itself. And so there is this range of uh, wave number that you can probe. And in fact, the two wave numbers cross. So there will be a time in the future and you will not be able to probe any wavelength because the minimum wavelength would be the same as the maximum wavelength. And uh, this is an advanced textbook that includes a lot of material, uh, some of which I'll cover in my lectures. Uh, it should appear uh, in print in December 2012, so at the end of this year. And uh, anyone interested uh, might want to have a look at this book for more details. Uh, I also wrote a book uh, two years ago that is for advanced undergraduates. Uh, so this is at a lower level. It's a shorter book, uh, but it also discusses the same processes that I'll describe today. So uh, the interesting question is when and how did the first stars and black holes form in the universe? When did the process of star formation start? And as I mentioned, stars like the sun or uh, galaxies like the Milky Way did not exist if you go back far enough, simply because the density of the universe itself was higher than the density of these objects. So obviously these objects did not exist uh, beyond a certain density extrapolating backwards. And the standard model of cosmology does make predictions as to when they actually formed. And when making these predictions, we have to keep in mind that we are using the standard model of not only cosmology, but of particle physics. And uh, we are also using uh, the standard law that the initial conditions were dictated by inflation. And that the universe is uh, dominated, the matter content of the universe is dominated by weakly interacting cold dark matter particles. And of course, uh, we do not stick to those assumptions necessarily, and uh, we would be really uh, uh, happy to find surprises because they would signal new physics. And astrophysics has a long tradition of finding new physics. And so uh, it would really be uh, fantastic if you were to learn something new about the nature of by studying uh, the high redshift universe. And just to give you an example that uh, we don't really know what the dark matter is that, and that surprises may come, uh, we wrote a paper with Neil Weiner just last year talking about uh, an unusual property of the dark matter that could make a difference for small galaxies. So if you, for example, imagine that the dark matter is weakly interacting with ordinary matter, but is, it's strongly interacting with itself, it's a very different behavior. Uh, and by strongly interacting, what I mean is that the dark matter particles scatter off each other with a cross-section that is comparable to the Thomson cross-section of electromagnetism uh, divided by the proton mass. So what matters is the cross-section per unit mass of a particle. Um, and so if the cross-section <coughs> for self-scattering is very large, what, ha what happens is that as you make a galaxy, the central density cusp allows particles to scatter off each other. And if you take the cross-section to behave similar to the Coulomb cross-section for ordinary matter, so that at high velocities you get a, a, a decline in the collision cross-section. Uh, so the collision uh, rate is velocity-dependent. Then you find that 
you get interesting uh, changes in the central cusp profiles of uh, small galaxies, dwarf galaxies, as required by data. By we have some data on the mass distribution of dwarf galaxies, which indicates the need for such a thing. Uh, also, you can imagine that dark matter may have excited states, like ordinary atoms have. And in fact, if you allow the state to have of order 10 electron volts per GeV, like uh, a hydrogen atom has, then you get significant effects for the characteristic uh, velocities in dwarf galaxies. So these, these are examples of features of the dark matter that may exist and would make a big difference. And on large scales, even though on small scales as you make the dwarf galaxies, you see differences. And we simulated this with uh, Mark Vogelsberger and Jesus uh, Zavala. Uh, even though you get changes on dwarf galaxy scales, on large scales, you don't get much difference from the standard cold dark matter picture. And the reason is that uh, in the uh, early universe, the collision probability of these particles of each other is very small. And in, in very massive objects, like clusters of galaxies, the collision probability is small because of the velocity dependence of the cross-section. So there is room for uh, unknowns about the dark matter that could make a, a, a big difference for the picture that we have. Now, in terms of observations, we have the cosmic microwave background polarization that uh, indicates that the microwave background photons, once they came to us, towards us, from the last scattering surface, it was not really the last scattering surface. About 9% uh, of those photons scattered between a redshift of 1100 and the present time. And uh, we can tell that some of these electrons were scattered because we see that the microwave background is polarized on large angular scales, on scales that are bigger than the scale of the horizon back at the redshift of 1100. So the only way to achieve coherence of polarization on scales bigger than the size of the universe, the scale of the horizon, back at the redshift of 1100, is to scatter the photons at a later time when the horizon was bigger. And the characteristic scale that one uh, assigns to this um, optical depth is uh, uh, associated with a redshift of, of order 10. So you have the, the, the integral of uh, the free electrons in the universe across the horizon at the redshift 10 gives you roughly a chance of scattering of order 10%. And therefore, we can infer that uh, electrons uh, were produced or hydrogen was ionized uh, roughly uh, 500 million years after the Big Bang. That corresponds to a redshift of 10. Um, and that's pr that presumably occurred due to the formation of the first galaxies, because the two, uh, uh, there is this coincidence that the prediction for the first galaxies uh, is that the formation rate was for the 10. Now, there are several uh, subtleties that one has to in in include when dealing with the behavior of, of gas and how it responds to the dark matter fluctuations. In particular, as I mentioned yesterday, the baryons are influenced by the sound waves that were left behind uh, in the radiation fluid. And the radiation fluid, when the baryons were coupled to it, uh, it had a sound speed of order, the speed of light divided by square root of 3. And when you perturb the universe at a given point, you get a, sound, a spherical sound wave that moves out to a distance of the sound speed times the age of the universe at that time. And what you find is after a combination, shortly after a combination, uh, the baryons are left with some residual motions due to these sound waves that were bouncing around. And these characteristic velocities are for the 30 kilometers per second relative to the dark matter. The dark matter was not coupled to the radiation because it's weakly interacting with, with the electromagnetism. And so these streaming velocities uh, are effectively um, associated with winds. Uh, th there is a wind of the baryons locally in regions of order a few co-moving megaparsecs. The wind is coherent. You can calculate the coherence scale of these streaming motions. Uh, and it turns out that these winds of the baryons relative to the dark matter can make a difference uh, when the first objects form. But uh, the relative velocities decay as 1 over 1 plus z. And therefore, they are affecting only uh, dark matter halos that are um, 
small, that are of order 10 to the 6 solar masses or less. Uh, and those halos are well below the characteristic uh, temperature associated with hydrogen cooling, uh, atomic hydrogen cooling. You can cool gas in such halos and make stars only due to molecular chemistry. And so there could be a significant effect of these winds on the formation of stars in the smallest halos of order the genes mass or up to 10 to the 6 solar masses, but not on bigger halos. And therefore, the significance of these winds is not at all clear. I mean, it may have affected the very early objects, but not much beyond that. So here is a diagram showing the cooling rate of primordial uh, hydrogen left over from the Big Bang. It was mostly uh, hydrogen and 25% um, or 24% helium by mass. Um, and uh, in red here is the cooling rate of the gas normalized to the hydrogen density squared in ergs centimeter cubed per second. And the horizontal axis shows the temperature of the gas. And you can see a very sharp drop in the cooling rate of the gas around 10,000 degrees Kelvin. And the reason is simple. Hydrogen does not get excited at temperatures below 10,000 degrees because the first level that uh, of excitation requires 10 electron volts and you don't have photons or particles on the Maxwellian uh, far into the 10 electron volt kinetic energy range when the temperature drops below 10 to the 4 degrees Kelvin. And so there is no effective cooling below that due to uh, atomic hydrogen. However, molecular hydrogen is able to cool the gas down to uh, a few hundred degrees Kelvin because it can be excited. And you can make molecular hydrogen. So in fact, uh, when people do simulations, and I'll show some results, uh, you can imagine a cloud of gas collapsing uh, and then molecular hydrogen forming within this cloud. Uh, and and we're talking about low mass halos here of the order of uh, just above the genes mass of order 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 uh, solar masses, uh, which form around redshift 50 or so, if several tens. Uh, and then, of course, molecular hydrogen is able to cool the gas to a few hundred degrees Kelvin. Uh, and then the gas fragments, uh, perhaps into a single star, maybe into a few stars. So this is called population three stars, simply because people used up the term population one and two for describing stars in our galaxy. Um, population one stars are stars, old stars in the inner part of the galaxy. Population two stars are in the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. And then uh, the only label left for cosmologists to, dis to discuss an early population of stars that has nothing to do with the ones that we see in our galaxy is to call them population three. Uh, but in fact, they're called population 3.1 by now because there is another uh, uh, way or path of making uh, stars. But let me start with population 3.1. So this, this is a, a result from a simulation. And what is done here is uh, starting from cosmological initial conditions and letting a gas cloud collapse and then zooming into the inner, innermost region. Uh, and the innermost region uh, is only uh, a few stellar radii in size. So in fact, we can zoom in almost into the surface, on, onto the surface of the star, the, the newborn protostar that is forming uh, near the center, and we can resolve uh, dynamics around there. Uh, and uh, when we do that, uh, if we use, uh, for example, uh, molecular hydrogen to cool the gas, then um, uh, you can uh, associate an accretion rate onto this protostar, which is of the order, on dimensional grounds, it needs to be of the order of the sound speed cubed of a Newton's constant. So if, I'm, if you're given the sound speed as the property of the medium around the seed uh, accreting seed mass that is accreting gas from its environment, then combining this sound speed with Newton's constant, you can get an accretion rate. And the accretion rate on dimensional grounds would be the sound speed cubed over Newton's constant. Uh, and another way to think of it is uh, uh, it's the amount of, if you take a certain amount of mass and you want, to, you want it to accrete on its dynamical time, which is 1 over the square root of, of G rho, that's roughly what you get. 
when uh, you associate um, the velocity with um, the sound speed in the medium, the infall velocity. So at any event, um, this uh, accretion rate scales as the temperature to the 3 halves power because the sound speed scales as the square root of the temperature. And if the minimum temperature is of order 200 degrees Kelvin, because that's the minimum temperature at which you can excite the uh, levels of uh, molecular then you end up with a characteristic mass for the stars. And the mass is the accretion uh, rate that you get at this temperature of 200 degrees Kelvin times the, the time it takes a star uh, to uh, burn its uh, nuclear fuel and, uh, and either explode or collapse, uh, which is of order a few million years if we are talking about massive stars. And so you do end up with a very massive in this case, um, which uh, have a mass more than 10 solar masses and could have masses of order 100 or several hundred solar masses, much more than the characteristic mass of stars in the local universe. And the reason for that is that the temperature of the gas that makes stars in the Milky Way galaxy is much lower than 200 degrees Kelvin. It's of order tens of degrees Kelvin. And so the fact that we can cool the gas, the primordial gas, only to this temperature floor means that we have necessarily a high accretion rate that makes more massive stars. But more recent simulations, as of a few years ago, indicated that when you zoom in and resolve the accretion disk that forms around the protostar, it turns out that the gas actually fragments into many pieces. You don't just have a single star. Uh, and in fact, you get multiples or binaries. Uh, actually, more often you get several seeds of, of uh, protostars excrete gas from the disk. And some of them may get ejected from the disk. The problem is that these simulations cannot continue be beyond a thousand years or so in the lifetime of these accretion disks. And we want to, in principle, to find out after a million years what is the mass function of fragments that you end up with. So with present day computers, we are unable to do that. Yes, uh, so when you have a disk, if it's cold enough, uh, it will fragment uh, because uh, gravitationally, um, the gravitational force that the fragments, that will enable the fragments to form and collapse uh, is stronger than uh, the thermal force or the centrifugal force that tries to prevent that. And there is a stability criterion uh, that was derived back in the 60s by Alar Toomer. Uh, and you can show that these disks that are found in the simulations are unstable according to this stability condition. Now, once stars produce light, uh, this light is able to ionize or break the hydrogen atoms uh, into their constituent electrons and protons. And then the chemistry is quite different. Uh, instead of just making a hydrogen uh, molecule, you can uh, make a hydrogen deuterium molecule, which happens to be more effective at cooling the gas. And the chemistry of making HD uh, requires free electrons. So uh, HD is not reduced uh, much uh, in the very first generation of collapsing object because there are no free electrons uh, left from cosmological recombination, only a fraction of 10 minus 4, 10 minus 5 of the total number of particles. But once you ionize the gas, then you accelerate the formation of HD. And that cools the gas down to lower temperatures, so for their 100 degrees Kelvin. And then, in principle, the collapse is able to make lower mass objects. And that's what we call population 3.2. And so just to give you uh, an overall picture, this is a sketch illustrating. This is from uh, the forthcoming book, illustrating the uh, history of events. Uh, first, the population 3.1 stars form. Uh, inside low mass halos, uh, then they produce radiation uh, that uh, allows lower mass stars to form population 3.2. Um, turns out that um, time you uh, these stars produce also radiation that can destroy uh, molecular hydrogen. Can molecular hydrogen is very fragile. It can be easily photodissociated by the so-called Lyman-Werner photons. And as a result of that, um, the small halos, the mini halos that made stars in the first place, 
uh, are unable to do the molecular chemistry of uh, H2 or HD. And so one has to wait until bigger halos form in which cooling is mediated by atomic hydrogen. And these are halos in which the virial temperature is above 10,000 degrees Kelvin. So uh, in terms of observing uh, or mapping the distribution of matter in the universe, we can do one of two things. We can either observe the stars or we can, in principle, map the distribution of diffuse gas. So let me start with observing the stars. And this is a diagram from my lecture yesterday in which I showed the mass in uh, the mass density in halos uh, below a certain uh, mass or around a certain mass, per logarithmic mass interval. And at redshift of 50, of course, uh, one makes only uh, halos of 10 to the 6 uh, or, or less uh, solar masses. Uh, but then starting at redshift 20, bigger and bigger halos are being made, uh, approaching masses of uh, hydrogen cooling threshold which is around 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 solar masses. <coughs> and the process of uh, galaxy formation involves several stages. First, the halo, the dark matter halo forms. Then, of course, gas uh, is accreting along with the dark matter into that halo. Uh, and the, the gas is able to cool. And as a result of that, it makes a central disk uh, because eventually the centrifugal force prevents the gas from sinking all the way to the very center. So once you make a disk, uh, inside the disk uh, there is an interstellar medium, there is some gas, and the gas is able to cool, make stars, the stars have some feedback on the gas, and then the gas cools again and makes more stars, and in the meantime you can get winds that carry gas out of the disk, so it's not a closed box. You can also make a black hole at the center, and the black hole also has some feedback on its environment. So that's a very complicated diagram. And as I mentioned, um, we understand very well how cold dark matter would behave, but we cannot observe it. Uh, and we can observe the baryons, the ordinary matter, but we cannot really um, simulate it uh, precisely at the moment because of these complicated uh, feedback processes. And the most uh, eff effective way of mapping either uh, the distribution of gas in inside galaxies or outside of galaxies is using hydrogen because hydrogen is the most abundant element that was produced in the Big Bang. And there are two important transitions that I'll describe today that hydrogen has. The first is the Lyman alpha transition from the first excited level, n equal 2, to the ground state, n equal 1. And by the way, Theodore Lyman it, it was a real person. He was actually the head of the physics department at Harvard about five years ago. Um, and he discovered this, uh, the Lyman series uh, before quant just before uh, quantum mechanics was developed to describe, or around the same time, actually. Um, and the wavelength of this transition from n equal 2 to n equal 1 is uh, 1216 angstrom. Um, there is another transition that has to do with the relative orientation of the spin of the electron relative to the proton. So the hydrogen atom has a proton and an electron, and if the two spins are aligned, you get a higher energy state. And the difference between them is associated with a wavelength of uh, close to 21 centimeter. And I'll describe the use of these two transitions. Usually hydrogen is sitting in the ground state because the decay, the decay time for it to the ground state is much shorter than all the time scales in cosmology. And so you find the hydrogen in the ground state and every now and then it gets excited and you can get an emission of Lyman alpha photons or uh, 21 centimeters. And I'll describe these processes <coughs> through my talk. So as an example for uh, Lyman alpha emission from galaxies, I'm showing here some um, images from a simulation that Andrea uh, was, Andrea's group uh, did uh, recently, uh, where you see the gas glowing in Lyman alpha as it makes uh, a galaxy. And in fact, the flux that you observe in the Lyman alpha line uh, depends on the observed wavelength, and you get a characteristic shape uh, of the Lyman alpha line. 
uh, the Lyman alpha resonance has a very high cross section, so the photons uh, scatter many times inside the gas be before they escape. Uh, and usually they escape only in the wings of the line. The first galaxies that were made at high redshifts corresponded to the tallest peaks. So if you go to the Himalayas and you look at the tallest mountain peaks in the Himalayas, what you find is that they are clustered, highly clustered, simply because it's much easier if you're sitting on a, 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 a large-scale range um, that is elevated. It's really easy to stick uh, above all the other peaks because you're starting from uh, an advantage uh, locally uh, where the uh, background density uh, is already, or in the case of mountains, the, the height is already elevated. And then just small perturbations on top of that bring you to higher peaks than uh, you find anywhere else. And so the same is true for galaxies. Now we're looking at the density, the over density uh, as a function of space. And in regions that ha have uh, large scale over densities, uh, it's much easier for small scale peaks peaks uh, corresponding to galaxies to stick above a, a given threshold. Discussed, objects are made once the overdensity approaches unity. So at very early times, since we're talking about a Gaussian random field, uh, only rare peaks uh, are able to stick uh, above the threshold. But then as time goes on, the entire density field grows. And uh, I discussed yesterday that the amplitude of density perturbations grow like the scale factor at early times. And so as they grow, more and more peaks stick above this uh, threshold for making objects. And that has an important consequence that, uh, in fact, galaxies should be very clustered early on and less clustered as time goes on later. Uh, but if you calculate the scale over which you expect them to be clustered, you find that it's, it's very large. It's of order 100 co-moving megaparsecs, uh, even at redshift 10. Uh, and that is uh, an important insight uh, because it means that if you wanted to simulate the universe uh, and you wanted to uh, pick up a volume of a box in which you simulate the initial conditions and follow the formation of galaxies, uh, what you want is to have the box bigger than 100 co-moving megaparsecs. And in the early stages, in the early phase of uh, research on reionization, people actually used simulation boxes of order a few megaparsecs. And when we told them that's not enough, they were arguing with us that it's actually enough to simulate small volumes because the galaxies that form within these volumes use up matter from much smaller regions within the simulation box. But that's not really the point. The point is that galaxies are clustered on much larger scales, and by now, we have simulations that cover uh, a, a scale bigger than 100 co-moving megaparsecs. Of course, the reason it was not done early on is because it's very challenging. And the reason uh, it's challenging is because you don't only need to simulate a, a chunk of the universe of order 100 co-moving megaparsecs, but you also need to resolve inside this box very small objects, the dwarf galaxies that formed early on. And if you wanted to calculate how reionization progresses, what you want to find is how the radiation emitted by those dwarf galaxies affected the gas around them. So you want to uh, simulate this box and follow not only gravity, but follow, of course, the hydrodynamics of the gas and the radiative transfer of the ionizing photons. <laughs> and find out the feedback that, those, that this radiation field has on the gas and, uh, of course, this includes uh, dissociation of molecular hydrogen, uh, ionization of the hydrogen, heating of the gas due to x-rays, for example, which is very important, as we'll see in a minute, and enrichment of the, of the gas by uh, heavy elements that are produced in supernova explosions. Astronomers, uh, anything heavier than, than helium is caused by astronomers' uh, metal. Okay, but that's just... Uh, a label um, that we use. Um, and these heavy elements are produced uh, in the interiors of stars, and massive stars are able to explode and enrich the surrounding gas with those heavy elements. And of course, once you enrich the gas with heavy elements, the cooling of the gas is much more effective. You end up with making smaller stars as a result. 
So that's important for the mass function of stars. Now, what, are the, what is the requirement uh, for the universe to get ionized? Uh, by, and let's now consider normal stars, the ones that we find around us. First, you need to produce at least one photon, one ionizing photon per proton in the universe. And second, once you uh, provided each hydrogen atom with uh, an ionizing photon, you need to keep the intergalactic medium, which is denoted, abbreviated as IgM in the literature, uh, you need to keep the medium um, ionized. And that means that you need to compensate for combinations. Once you ionize a hydrogen uh, into an, a free electron and a proton, the free electron and the proton may combine later on. And so to get the first condition satisfied, you need a certain uh, number of stars per unit volume in the universe, or a certain mass in, in, in stars per unit volume of the, uni of the universe. And uh, what you find is that you need a million uh, solar masses per co-moving megaparsec cubed in the universe, uh, assuming that all the ionizing photons from these stars are able to escape from their host galaxies and end up ionizing the medium in between the galaxies. But if s some of these photons are absorbed inside the galaxies, only a fraction of them escapes, uh, then you have to introduce this escape fraction, F escape, to the minus one in this formula because you need to produce many more photons now, uh, only a fraction of which is able to escape from the galaxies. But are, you, are you assuming for the ion mass? So here I'm assuming a mass function of stars similar to the one we see in the Milky Way galaxy. So in population, three st uh, population two stars. If you allow for population three stars, then you get many more ionizing photons um, produced, but uh, uh, the problem with that is as soon as uh, heavy elements enrich the gas, you end up making normal stars. And so I conservatively, I just used uh, population two stars. Now, to keep the intergalactic medium ionized, you need to compensate for a combination. So uh, it turns out that the condition there is that you need to keep making new stars in order to compensate for a combinations. And uh, this number here, 10 to the minus 3, solar masses per year per cubic co-moving megaparsec gives you the star formation rate that is required to compensate for combinations. So again, there is the escape fraction factor. Uh, but now, because we compensate for combinations, recombinations are the, co the recombination rate uh, is uh, uh, proportional to density squared. And so you end up uh, uh, per uh, you end up with uh, a rate that goes like the density uh, for the uh, star formation rate per unit volume. Uh, it goes like 1 plus z cubed. So in fact, as you go to higher redshifts, because recombination rate goes like density squared, you end up, you, you, you really end up needing more formation rate than at low redshifts. Now, in addition, there is the so-called clumpiness factor, which tells you what's the average value of the density squared divided by the average value of the density squared. So that illustrates how clumpy the gas is relative to a uniform distribution, the gas in the intergalactic medium, this clumpiness factor. So uh, this is a requirement. And the interesting question is whether the universe was able to satisfy these requirements with the stars that we are able to see at those high redshifts. And here is an illustration of the mass density in stars. That is the first condition that I showed as a function of redshift. And 13.7 billion years after the Big Bang, that's the present time, we have of the order of uh, 10 to the 9 solar masses per uh, cube, uh, per co-moving megaparsec cube zero, but when we go to redshift five and above, you find that the, star form the, the stellar mass density back then, by summing the stars in all the galaxies that we see, uh, corresponds to only 1% of the present day mass density. So in fact, only one out of 100 stars could have been made above redshift five uh, when we look at local stars. 
And this red line defines one ionizing photon per hydrogen atom. Uh, and you can see that uh, at, as we get to redshifts above six, we're getting pretty close to this red line. And so we barely, uh, we are barely able to ionize the universe with the observed population of, of galaxies. And people are able uh, to detect galaxies these days out to uh, relatively high redshift. So this is an example uh, with the very large uh, telescope, the European VLT, uh, of uh, discovery of a galaxy at a redshift of 7.1 spectroscopically. Uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope, the deepest image of the Hubble Space Telescope, we know of um, 140 galaxies at redshift 7 to 8. Uh, and the way we discover them is simply by uh, seeing the absorption of the intergalactic medium uh, all the way uh, to the corresponding redshift, the, the Lyman alpha absorption by the hydrogen along the line of sight, which stops at the redshift of the source. So from seeing a step in the spectrum, we can tell uh, what is the redshift of, of those galaxies. And when we plot the star formation rate per unit volume, we get uh, this plot, and that's from a paper by Buens uh, et al. Uh, but the requirement that I showed uh, uh, for, us for a, an escape fraction over clumpiness uh, of one is shown as the red line. And once again, uh, as we go towards redshift of order seven or eight, we're getting pretty close to the minimum level required to keep the, the intergalactic medium ionized. But I'm not too worried about th that. Uh, because back in 2000, we already expected that most of the star formation at redshifts above six uh, should be in galaxies that are too faint for us to see. If you do, you go through the calculations, and in fact, uh, Andrea also did similar calculations, uh, you find that even uh, the generation of telescopes will not be able to see all of the star formation, most of the star formation at those high redshifts. And this is an illustration from uh, a, a paper that was just uh, pub uh, posted uh, a few weeks ago, uh, illustrating uh, by Finkelstein et al., uh, illustrating that uh, these are different uh, lines. These gray regions are different uh, numbers for the clumpiness over the escape fraction, this factor that in the formula for keeping the intergalactic medium ionized. And uh, the characteristic values that are found from simulations are uh, somewhere around um, 10 or so would be a reasonable number, maybe 30. Uh, and based on the existing surveys of galaxies, uh, we have this re uh, green line. And what we can definitely say is that the observed galaxies would be able to ionize or keep the gas ionized at redshifts below 6, but they will not be able to do so above redshift 9. So the observed population of galaxies are simply, um, you just don't see enough stars to be able to ionize the universe completely before redshift 10. And we will have much better data with the next generation of telescopes, in particular the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, which is called the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, James Webb was a NASA director, and the reason it's called after him, the main reason is to keep this project alive. We want the telescope to fly, and it's important to call it after an important uh, NASA director. Uh, the launch date was postponed recently uh, due to budgetary problems. Uh, when Andrea and I were young, we thought that it would be launched by now, right? Uh, and it has been uh, six years into the future for a while. We hope that it will uh, fly, because it will revolutionize or at least give us much more insight as to the early populations of s galaxies at redshift uh, 10 or so. Uh, this is a, a mock uh, uh, illustration of, of, of the James Webb Space Telescope. And you can see the actual size. And these, these are uh, shades that uh, block the sunlight. And of course, there, there are plans to build bigger telescopes on the ground that will bear light buckets that will be sensitive to fainter galaxies, fainter sources from early cosmic times. Uh, the most ambitious uh, pr program is the European uh, Extremely Large Telescope, uh, 42 meters in aperture in diameter. 
Uh, there is a plan to build a 30-meter telescope uh, in the United States and another plan to build a 24-meter uh, effective diameter telescope, the Giant Magellan Telescope, uh, is a partner in. So these teles big telescopes will be, uh, will be sensitive to fainter galaxies at uh, high redshifts. And of course, on the theoretical front, we are uh, able to produce simulations of reionization. And what you see here is a movie uh, made by a high heat track uh, back in 2008, where the red indicates ionized gas. And starting from high redshift, the gas eventually gets uh, fully ionized once you get to redshifts below six. And of course, the process starts in the high density regions where most of the sources lie. And then it progresses into the voids. Uh, we can describe this process also analytically. Uh, we can try and understand how it uh, continues. It looks like a first order phase transition where you have nucleation sites and you grow uh, the second phase out of them so that eventually uh, the volume is occupied by this new phase of ionized hydrogen in this case. So there is this uh, phase where you have uh, individual galaxies making their own ionized regions. This is before the regions overlap, so it's called pre-overlap. And then later on, these uh, individual uh, ionized regions uh, start to overlap, uh, and new galaxies are being made. Uh, and then after that phase, of course, uh, eventually all the ionized bubbles overlap and uh, most of the volume of the universe is ionized. And to figure out the dynamics of this uh, process, all you need to do is to be an, a good accountant. You just need to count photons and compare them to the number of hydrogen atoms. And there is a very simple prescription that uh, allows you to calculate the characteristic size distribution of ionized regions. Uh, which is similar to calculating the number density of halos above a certain mass. You basically start with the big sphere and you ask, are there an enough ionizing photons produced within uh, that big sphere to ionize all the hydrogen atoms that we have within that big sphere? If the answer is no, then you reduce the size of the sphere until you get to a region small enough so that you have enough stars within that region to ionize it. And then you go to the next region and continue to do the same uh, procedure. And this can be done analytically in, uh, using a similar to the excursion set formalism that I mentioned yesterday. Or it can be done numerically. And in fact, uh, Andre Messenger here uh, uh, did beautiful simulations of this uh, process. And I'll show one of them in a minute. Um, when stars, especially massive stars, end their life, they make all kinds of uh, remnants. Uh, <coughs> stars less than 10 solar masses uh, typically make a white dwarf. But above that, uh, you can make a neutron uh, through a supernova explosion. Or you can make a black hole uh, if the star has uh, a mass above uh, 40 solar masses. And this is just a sketch of the boundary in the uh, progenitor star mass above which um, uh, you make a black hole. We don't really know uh, which fraction of stars at any given mass makes black holes versus neutron stars. Um, but then at very high masses, once uh, you go above uh, 140 solar masses, there is a new type of supernovae that forms. Uh, and that's called a parent stability supernova. And I'll discuss it in a minute. And then above 260 solar masses for very massive stars, uh, typically you end up, we expect, such a star to end up as a black hole. Now, the supernovae are particularly important because they uh, disperse the heavy elements produced in the interior of the progenitor star surrounding gas. And it's sufficient to enrich the gas by uh, 10 to the minus 3, or 0.1% uh, of the heavy element abundance that we find in the sun in order for uh, carbon and oxygen to cool the gas more effectively than molecular hydrogen. And in fact, uh, Andrea and collaborators show that dust can even do better than that. You just need uh, 10 to the minus 5 of the heavy element abundance uh, in the sun to do that. And so uh, transforming the population of stars from massive 
stars into uh, the more typical low mass stars that we find nowadays uh, is relatively straightforward. You just need to enrich the gas with trace amounts of heavy elements in order for it to cool much more effectively than molecular hydrogen would allow you. And one particular interesting type of supernovae are these pair instability supernova. Uh, and they are the best understood. So in fact, among all possible supernovae, these are the ones that we fully understand theoretically. All the others we have difficulties with. Despite several decades of simulations and calculations, people do not fully understand how supernovae explode, except for this one. And in this case, the physics is simple because uh, these are very massive stars between 140 and 200, uh, sorry, 240 solar masses. And once they consume their nuclear fuel, uh, uh, the hydrogen in the core, uh, and burn it into heavier elements, uh, then the center of the star heats up because uh, the star shrinks, the core of the star shrinks, and the temperature rises above the per production threshold, above uh, 10 to the 9 degrees Kelvin, so that electron-positron pairs start to be produced. Such massive stars are ordinarily uh, supported against gravity by the radiation in their interior. So radiation pressure is holding them against collapse. But once the radiation is converted into electron-positron pairs, the, the star loses pressure support, uh, the core collapses, makes more heavy elements, and then explodes. And nothing is left behind. There is no neutron star. You can follow the hydrodynamics of such explosions. Uh, it was done since the 60s when these explosions were predicted. Uh, they were not observed until recently. And in fact, by now, uh, there are examples known uh, possibly up to a redshift of four based on uh, a, a manuscript that was submitted to Nature, not posted yet, and not advertised yet. So this, we, we are looking forward to see this paper. But uh, uh, it was mentioned already in an Astro PH preprint that uh, we have examples up to a redshift of four. Yes, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. Well, uh, first of all, uh, the amount of energy that is released is could be 100 times bigger uh, from such massive stars because they're m very massive. You make a lot of nickel when they uh, collapse, and there is 100 times more energy being released in the explosion. Uh, but at the same time, this energy is carried by a lot of mass. And so um, w this energy eventually a fraction of it is radiated and we see the explosion uh, but the explosion is not always uh, very bright it just lasts for a much longer time uh, and there is one case that was discovered back in a supernova from 2007 called the two, uh, supernova 2007 bi uh, that had an estimated mass of nickel uh, of order five solar masses uh, much bigger, uh, two orders of magnitude bigger than the amount of nickel that you produce in a typical uh, supernova. Um, and you can predict, uh, make some estimates for the supernova rate that you expect at high redshifts and whether you will be able to see it with, um, for example, JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope. And the answer is yes, uh, if you combine several fields uh, of uh, uh, one of the uh, cameras on, on JWST, you should be able to do that. And we uh, derived that in a recent uh, paper with uh, my student, uh, Tony Pan, uh, using, uh, and then Kaysen was also on that paper, using uh, the parameters for JWST, one of its cameras that has a field of view of 10 arc seconds squared, uh, eight hours of integration, allows you to, to potentially detect such supernovae from redshifts of order uh, um, 6 to 10. Now, there is another type of explosions uh, that uh, result from a, an imploding a massive star. So when you imagine a, massi a very massive star, bigger than, let's say, uh, uh, 240 solar masses that collapses to a black hole, or bigger in between 40 and 160 solar masses, um, the core of the star collapses to make the black hole, but then you might actually form an accretion torus around the black hole, and jets 
could be produced in that process. Jets being formed in super, around supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies, and I'll show some images tomorrow. Uh, sorry, next, in the next lecture. Um, um, but uh, if you imagine the same process taking place in when you make a, a small black hole, stellar mass black hole in the center of a star, um, the, the jets that are produced could, uh, in principle, uh, be quite similar to those that are produced around supermassive black holes. And the, the only difference is that these jets are produced near the center and now they are surrounded by a very thick envelope of the star that doesn't really know that the black hole had formed already. Uh, so these jets have to penetrate through uh, the envelope of the star and they can drill a hole in the star and eventually when they come out the observer uh, would see a flash of gamma rays, x-rays and so forth. And this, this is the popular model for long duration gamma rays where you can in principle observe the collapse of a star one star at a time. And because they are so powerful, these gamma ray bursts, uh, you could in principle see them, them and their afterglows, all the way out to the time when the first stars were formed. And there are several proposals for building up the next generation of uh, gamma ray burst uh, telescopes uh, that will target the first population of stars, uh, high redshift. None of these proposals is funded at the moment, unfortunately. And the existing uh, finder uh, is the SWIFT uh, satellite. And um, by now we have an example of a gamma ray burst at a redshift of 8.3 um, that uh, was actually identified uh, a bit late. Uh, so the afterglow uh, was, uh, did, was not observed uh, with at the same level of we would like it to be observed. Uh, they didn't have a good spectrum. Uh, but we can nevertheless infer the redshift to be quite high. Uh, and there was another one that was inferred to be at a redshift around 9.4. In principle, we can find such gamma ray bursts even above redshift 10. And it would be nice to find one that is uh, potentially associated with population three stars. But an interesting frontier beyond that is to observe the diffuse, not just the stars, as I mentioned until now, but actually try and image the gas in between the galaxies. And the traditional way of doing that is to have a very bright source, for example, a quasar, a bright accreting black hole, supermassive black hole. I'll discuss those in my next lecture. Uh, we have these quasars at high redshifts. And then, as you observe these quasars, the photons coming from the quasar uh, are absorbed by clouds of gas, concentrations of, of hydrogen, along the line of sight. And even though most of the hydrogen is ionized after, uh, uh, at, at redshifts below 6, there are still uh, enhanced levels of neutral hydrogen in overdense regions, because hydrogen recombines faster in overdense regions. So when the line of sight passes through overdense regions, either sheets or filaments in the intergalactic medium, the cosmic web of structure, then you would get these absorption features. This is called the Lyman alpha forest. And you get it as a function of wavelength because at any given distance along the line of sight, there is a different wavelength at which the Lyman alpha photons uh, resonate with the local hydrogen atoms. So when we observe this cloud, we get a certain redshift. When we observe another cloud, we get a different redshift. So when we take the spectrum of the quasar, we see all these absorption corresponding to different absorption redshifts of the Lyman alpha resonance. And this is an illustration of a, a, a set of quasars at different redshifts in the observed wavelength uh, scale. And as we go to higher redshifts, of course, uh, the Lyman alpha wavelength redshifts to a longer uh, value. So at the edge here, we are talking about a, re a redshift z of uh, 6.4. 1 plus z is 7.4. So you need to multiply 12, 16 angstrom times 7.4 to see what is the observed, uh, predict the observed wavelength. And so you, you see a lot of uh, absorption at these high redshifts. Um, but then as uh, you move to lower redshifts, there is some transmission. 
Um, and people have measured the absorption due to the Lyman alpha resonance. So even trace amounts of hydrogen are sufficient to absorb most of the flux of the quasar short of the Lyman alpha resonance at the quasar redshift. And, and so this is not a good probe of the state when most of the medium was neutral. It's a good probe of the state of the intergalactic medium when most of the gas is ionized at low redshifts. <coughs> and the highest redshift quasar that we have is uh, at a redshift of 7.1 or 7.085. Uh, this is the Lyman alpha emission line from the quasar, which uh, is then truncated, cropped. Uh, due to the absorption by hydrogen close to the redshift of the quasar. And in fact, the entire flux is absorbed here. But from the shape of the uh, truncation of the Lyman alpha emission line, we can tell, uh, roughly speaking, whether uh, w what is the level or what is the fraction of the hydrogen that is neutral uh, at that redshift. And when you do it naively, you find that it's definitely more absorption than you expect from 10% of the hydrogen in the universe, in the region of uh, neutral. It's uh, consistent with several tens of percent absorption, but it's definitely not all neutral because then we would get more, ab more uh, absorption off the line at wavelengths that are longer than uh, the, the resonant wavelength. So here we are going into the wing of the absorption uh, cross section as we go to a longer wavelengths than the ones corresponding to the redshift of the quasar. Now, line, as I mentioned already, which has to do with the spin, uh, the relative orientation of the spin of the proton relative to the electron. And suppose the spin of the proton is up. If the spin of the electron is up, you get a higher energy state compared to the state when the spin is down. And the difference in energy corresponds to a wavelength of 21 centimeter. Now this line, the spin flip transition of the electron uh, was predicted by Van der Halst uh, uh, back uh, in, 19, um, uh, in, in the 1940s. And uh, it was uh, actually observed by a physicist in the physics department at Harvard, Ed Purcell, that worked with uh, a young uh, PhD uh, student, uh, Doc uh, Ewen. And what Ed uh, decided to do, he didn't know if other groups are looking for this line, if the Dutch are looking for it. So they said, let's just go ahead and, and see if there is any emission from the sky. So he stuck a horn antenna in the, out of the window of uh, the physics department, the fourth floor. Uh, they built for a year. They w worked on weekends only. And they, within a year, they managed to build this thing. And the main challenge was that rain used to uh, bring water into the office. And uh, also students were, I mean, you can see here the background of Harvard University. Uh, students would throw snowballs into it and uh, disturb the experiment. Um, but uh, after a year, they detected the line. And uh, then they found out that Van der Helst is actually spending a sabbatical uh, at uh, the observatory at Harvard University, where I come from. And uh, uh, Ewen went to speak with him, and the uh, Ort happened to be there. And uh, it turns out that the Dutch were also searching for this line. And they couldn't really detect it because they didn't have the technical, um, uh, the technical tricks that were used in this experiment. And so what Ewen told them about how to, to really do it technically, they did it and detected it. And the two papers appeared side to side. So it's a, a sign of. Uh, uh, how collaboration can be done in science, and credit is still given to uh, Purcell and Ewen for detecting it. Uh, and that's uh, Ed Purcell. This is uh, Doc Ewen back then. Um, so this was uh, the beginning of using the 21 centimeter line for observational uh, astronomy. And what they back then they saw the signal coming from the Milky Way galaxy, which was quite large. If they knew that the Dutch were trying to find it and couldn't find it, they would not do the experiment. But uh, it just shows that sometimes it's good to just go ahead and do an experiment even with, without listening to theories or other uh, observers. Um, and by now, this line is extremely useful in mapping hydrogen in galaxies. But it was not used for cosmology as of yet. And the idea would be to, uh, in, in principle, map the distribution of hydrogen before it was ionized at high redshifts using this line, um, which was predicted in 1944 by uh, Van der Helst. 
So people usually associate an excitation temperature through uh, a simple Boltzmann factor uh, to the number of atoms that are in the upper state relative to the number of atoms in the lower state. So uh, if you have gas at a certain temperature and it's in uh, thermodynamic equilibrium, then this would be the temperature of the gas here. And the number of atoms in the upper state relative to the lower state will be represented by a Boltzmann factor e to the power minus the energy difference between the two states, zero, which corresponds to 0 0.07 degrees Kelvin, divided by the temperature. But the excitation temperature of, uh, or, or the number of atoms in the upper state may be in thermodynamic equilibrium. And so to def define the excitation state of, of the gas, the hydrogen gas, people use the spin temperature through the same exponential factor. So the spin temperature simply is equivalent to saying how many atoms are in the upper state versus the lower state. And the factor of three here is simply the spin degeneracy factor of the upper state relative to the lower state. The upper state is a triplet. The lower state is a singlet. Now, there are several processes that uh, can operate. Uh, atomic collisions will simply uh, couple the spin temperature, the excitation temperature, to the gas kinetic temperature. So atoms will collide and will try to reach an equilibrium in which the spin temperature equals the gas kinetic temperature. The same thing happens with Lyman alpha photons. It turns out that Lyman alpha photons scatter so much in the gas that they reach a color temperature equal to the gas kinetic temperature. And so when Lyman alpha photons scatter in the hydrogen gas, they tend to bring the spin temperature to the kinetic temperature of the gas as well just like atomic collisions would do. Okay, so the spin temperature is coupled to the kinetic through two processes. And then uh, there is, of course, the possible coupling to the cosmic microwave background. And the microwave background temperature has nothing to do with the kinetic temperature of the gas, uh, as I'll show in a few minutes. Uh, it could be quite different. And so in this case, the coupling to the microwave background tries to bring the spin temperature of the excitation temperature of the gas to the microwave background temperature. And this is just a radiative process by which the atom absorbs and emits photons um, and couples to the microwave background. Generally speaking, what we would like to do is once these uh, ionized bubbles form, we would like to image the hydrogen between these bubbles. And that's just like slicing uh, Swiss cheese. So imagine Swiss cheese that has holes in it. These are the ionized regions that uh, are devoid of, of cheese, and in this case, uh, atomic hydrogen. And by observing a certain, so this is in three dimensions here, and this is the line of sight here. So if we observe uh, a different wavelength, that corresponds to a different redshift. Uh, and by slicing, by observing, different wavelengths, we're basically slicing the universe at different redshifts, different distances from us. And we should get, if we slice it at separations that are comparable to the characteristic size of an ionized region, we should get different images for each slice. And we can get a three-dimensional map of the hydrogen distribution because we are working with a resonant line, the 21 centimeter line, that is associated with a very specific wavelength. And so by observing different wavelengths, we are looking at the hydrogen at different redshifts. And this is an artist visualization of what we are after uh, uh, from a Scientific American article that I wrote uh, a while ago. Uh, when you make the very first stars, they produce ionized bubbles around them. Uh, then eventually these bubbles overlap and the entire universe gets ionized. And if you were to take uh, slices of the universe, you would find at early times that most of it is uh, neutral. And so the only structure that you see is due to the uh, density enhancement of hydrogen uh, in the filaments and sheets due to structure formation. But then once galaxies form and produce ionizing radiation, then there are these holes in the Swiss cheese that are starting to be made. And eventually, these holes overlap. And the entire universe gets ionized by a redshift of 6. And if you look at the processes that uh, uh, affect this history more closely, 
you identify several important milestones in the universe. The first thing to keep in mind is that once the universe recombines at the redshift of 1100, there is a little bit of uh, a residual fraction of ionizing f uh, or of, of um, uh, free electrons left behind uh, at the level of uh, 10 to the minus uh, 4 of the total number of electrons. And so these still couple the cosmic microwave background temperature and gas temperature down to a redshift of 200. So at a redshift of 200, the microwave background temperature and the hydrogen temperature is still the same. But starting at that point, there, there are not enough electrons to couple the microwave background temperature to the gas temperature. So the gas decouples thermally. And when you consider a non-relativistic gas of atoms, uh, then uh, for we, we already derived in my first the result that the wavelength of a photon gets stretched with a cosmic expansion like the scale factor. But you can associate a, a wavelength also with the wave function of a massive particle. We, it will be the de Broglie wavelength. And the de Broglie wavelength would also increase like the scale factor. The de Broglie wavelength is the Planck's constant divided by uh, the momentum of this particle. And so now when you calculate the temperature of a gas of non-relativistic particles, the temperature to the momentum squared over the mass of the proton, uh, and that would scale as 1 plus z squared. So uh, the kinetic temperature of, of gas, non, of non-relativistic particles, uh, changes as 1 plus z squared faster than the change in the microwave background temperature, which scales only as 1 plus z. So once the gas decouples from the microwave background, redshift 200, it starts cooling faster than the microwave background. At that point, it can be used uh, uh, in absorption. So because it's cooler than the microwave background, it absorbs the brightness of the microwave background behind it, uh, and you end up with a negative brightness temperature in the 21 centimeter line. So what I'm showing in this uh, diagram taken from uh, a paper that we wrote with Jonathan Pritchard, uh, showing the brightness temperature in milli-degrees Kelvin. It turns out that's the characteristic scale of interest. Um, going down to minus 40 or so uh, at the minimum here. Uh, at the redshift uh, between 160 to around 50, that's when you get this absorption trope. And, and the color blue here uh, shows absorption. Uh, red later on, as I'll discuss, um, uh, illustrates um, emission. So at early times we have absorption and negative uh, brightness temperature relative to the microwave background. Uh, but that's during the time when atomic collisions dominate and they keep the spin temperature lower uh, equal to the gas kinetic temperature and lower than the microwave background. But as the universe expands, the atomic collisions are not as effective. Uh, and eventually the atoms couple to the microwave background more strongly than atomic collisions can couple them. Uh, and so the excitation temperature, the spin temperature, uh, gets very close to the microwave background temperature at around the redshift of 40. And there is this black period during which you don't see the gas against the microwave background because it has exactly the same excitation temperature as the microwave background. So we cannot image the hydrogen around redshift 40. Um, but then the, uh, just around that time, by coincidence, the first galaxies form according to the cold dark matter standard model. Uh, and around that time, these galaxies, these stars, with Lyman alpha photons that would couple the spin temperature to the gas kinetic temperature once again. So it's not collisions now. It's actually Lyman alpha radiation that is doing that. And now you get the absorption to be even stronger than it was due to collisions. Because now the disparity between the microwave background temperature and the gas temperature is even stronger because the gas is, has cooled much more relative to the microwave background. So you get an even bigger absorption trough uh, here. But then uh, the first uh, stars also produce x-rays uh, if they make black holes that are accreting gas. Uh, these x-rays penetrate into the gas and heat it up. Uh, and so at that point, once the gas gets heated up, the spin temperature rises above the microwave background temperature, and you get an emission signal. 
So now you see the red. And by the way, this vertical axis is just one dimension on the sky. So you start to see fluctuations on the sky at that point. So following this absorption trough, we get an emission. This is, by the way, the global signal that we get by uh, summing over the entire sky. So this is the spectrum of the sky. Uh, lower frequencies correspond to higher redshifts because we are observing the same line, the 21 centimeter line, from an earlier time. So therefore, the frequency of the photons is lower or the wavelength is longer. Uh, if, you if you consider a redshift of 10 or so, the wavelength is 2 meters. It's roughly the height of a person. Uh, a redshift of 100 corresponds to 20 meters wavelength. That uh, doesn't really, uh, such a wavelength doesn't penetrate through the atmosphere. Um, uh, so we have to go to space if you want to, to image the gas at those early times. So what you see here is the spectrum of the sky. The brightness of the sky is a function of frequency. Uh, average, this is called the global signal. So first we get an absorption trough, disappears, a second absorption trough, and then an emission signal. And that emission signal eventually is truncated by the end of reionization. Once you ionize all the hydrogen in the universe, there is no more hydrogen to produce a signal. And you can see that the process continues. Uh, there is more and more dark in this image as you move to lower, lower redshifts. Uh, and you see that the hydrogen is being uh, destroyed by ionizing photons. So eventually, you get no signal. And that's the end of the ionization. So we, we can actually image the effect that the stars and black holes had on the hydrogen through the 21 centimeter line. And that's what makes it exciting. And you can do a very detailed calculation in which you calculate, for example, here the dotted line shows the microwave background temperature. Uh, the, uh, the steeper line here shows the gas uh, kinetic temperature. That's the dashed line going down and then up due to X-ray heating. And then the excitation temperature of the 21 centimeter line is sort of in between. It starts with the gas temperature, goes back to the microwave background, and then uh, due to Lyman alpha coupling, uh, goes below the microwave background, the second absorption trough, and then goes above the microwave background due to X-ray heating. And you can calculate the brightness temperature fluctuations due to that in three dimensions. You can calculate the power spectrum of brightness fluctuations due to this uh, process of reaction as a function of redshift and as a function of wave number. Uh, and in fact, uh, Andre Messenger uh, produced a beautiful uh, simulation that illustrates how this uh, evolves, how the signal, the 21 centimeter signal evolves as the redshift goes down uh, from high values, and here it's for the 40 and it goes down. The neutral fraction is still unity at those high redshifts. These are the this is the brightness temperature as a function of wave number. And now it starts to get ionized. And you can see here that the holes eat up the hydrogen everywhere, and the signal disappears eventually. And there is one interesting aspect uh, of, of the brightness of the 21 centimeter line that is worth emphasizing. Uh, the brightness that we observe is related to the optical depth uh, that we see of uh, hydrogen atoms along the line of sight times the difference between the spin temperature and the microwave background temperature. And there is a factor of 1 plus z here to take into account the redshift uh, of the brightness temperature. Now, imagine a region that is denser than the average. It has some over-density delta. And that's due to, fa to the fact that gas is flowing into this region. Uh, and the gas has some peculiar velocity, some velocity relative to the Hubble flow, an infall velocity in the case where delta is positive. Now, this optical depth that, uh, of the hydrogen is, of course, related to the number density of hydrogen atoms along the line of sight. But it also depends on how the velocity of the atoms relative to us changes. Be uh, so if we are observing a wavelength corresponding to a resonance with atoms at a particular redshift, as we move away from that redshift, atoms move away from the center of the line. So you get less and less absorption or emission and so this optical depth depends on the velocity gradient along the line of sight. Uh, so as the velocity of the atoms changes along the line of sight, we are losing uh, resonance with the line at a particular wavelength. And the steeper this gradient is, 
the less optical depth you get because the path length over which you get resonance gets shorter and shorter if you have a very sharp uh, velocity gradient. So overall, the optical depth depends on the density of the gas, but also on the velocity derivative along the line of sight. And this velocity derivative along the line of sight is simply the Hubble parameter if velocity locally is proportional to distance. And so without perturbing the universe, this would be just the Hubble parameter. But if you do perturb a region, then the Hubble, the, the infall velocity is modified. There is um, uh, the peculiar velocity on top of the Hubble flow. And you have to include that into account. So the region is actually uh, enhancing the density, but it's also modifying the, uh, the velocity gradient. And both effects are of the same magnitude of order delta. So the observer is looking at this region, and you can decompose the density field once again into Fourier modes. So for a given uh, wave number k, or wave vector k, uh, that uh, there is a, a, an angle between the direction of the wave vector k of the Fourier mode and the line of sight to the uh, observer. And you can show that the power spectrum is not isotropic anymore because it depends on this angle. The velocity gradient due to the uh, infall of gas onto a given region makes the brightness dependent on the direction of k, not just the amplitude of k. And it has a, a dependence on cosine theta squared because not only that it's sensitive to the radial component of the velocity, but it's also dependent on the radial derivative of velocity. So you end up with two factors of cosine theta projecting the k vector into the line of sight. And that makes the power spectrum not isotropic because now not only it depends on k, the amplitude of the wave number, but it also depends on the direction of the, wave of the mode. And we can measure how the brightness temperature changes uh, uh, in three dimensions, as I mentioned. So that allows us to, in principle, find the effects of peculiar velocities that are induced by gravity, which is very important because the isotropic component of the power spectrum is only sensitive to, um, is not only sensitive to, to gravity, but it's also sensitive to astrophysics, complicated astrophysics. So uh, let me show you the global uh, 21 centimeter and what it depends on, uh, speaking about astrophysics. If we had no stars, for example, then this uh, global signal of the 21 centimeter line would have an absorption trough, no Lyman alpha photons produced, so we would get just a zero signal after that because now the excitation temperature below redshift uh, of uh, uh, 40 or so, the excitation temperature is equal to the microwave background temperature. So we just get this initial trough. Now if, on the other hand, uh, there was no heating due to x-rays, uh, but there would be Lyman alpha photons produced, then of course we will get an absorption trough that is much more pronounced now because <laughs> gas is not being heated. The actual case where you include heating brings the gas temperature up, actually to positive value relative to the microwave background. And so without heating, we would get a much stronger signal. And in fact, the very first uh, experimental results may rule out uh, this situation because it's easy to rule it out. The signal that you would get is huge if um, there was no X-ray heating. Uh, you would get a, a trough, an absorption trough of uh, of a degree Kelvin uh, at, a w at a frequency of order 100 megahertz. And of course, the level of X-ray heating uh, dictates how deep is this absorption trough. So you can take the standard uh, uh, um, calibration that people use, and that's the black line. But if you allow uh, less X-ray heating, that's the red line, by two orders of magnitude, then you get a much deeper absorption trough. The same is true about the Lyman alpha uh, effect. If you allow lower level of a lower level of Lyman alpha emission, then of course you get closer to this case of no stars. Uh, and so, by observing this global signal, we can learn about uh, how much X-ray emission or Lyman alpha emission uh, was produced by the very early stars. Okay. Uh, this is a, an example of a, an experiment that the first one to go after the global signal. Uh, it's a single antenna that is integrating across the sky. And, um, it's a, 
a dipole antenna, so that's the sensitivity across the sky of this experiment. And it was able to already rule out a very sudden reionization scenario uh, at the level of uh, that, that reionization could not have been more sudden than a redshift interval uh, of 0 0.1. Reionization could not have happened within a redshift interval of 0 0.1. Um, and there are many experiments that are trying to go after the three-dimensional mapping of hydrogen. Uh, for example, the LOFAR experiment here in Europe, the Low Frequency Array, the Murchison Whitefield Array in Australia, the PAPER experiment in South Africa, uh, and 21 CM, uh, CMA in China, and the giant uh, meter wave radio telescope in India, and then a future uh, experiment, the Square Kilometer Array, um, that is now being promoted both in Australia and in South Africa uh, would reach a, a better sensitivity than the existing generation of experiments. And this is an example of the hardware in one of the experiments, the Murchison Whitefield Array uh, in Australia. It will have eventually 16, uh, well, it will have uh, many tiles, uh, 128 tiles of 16 dipole antenna each. And this is an example of an, a tile, and that's how the final experiment would look like. Um, so the group is working towards building the final uh, experiment, and within the next uh, few years, uh, we expect to get some interesting results. And this uh, array is spread over an area that has a characteri uh, characteristic size of a kilometer uh, with a few arc minutes resolution on the sky. The biggest challenge is, of course, emission by our own galaxy, foreground emission. There are also point sources which appear uh, along the line of sight. As, um, these are continuum emission synchrotron sources. They appear as uh, strips uh, in the noise map uh, because they emit uh, at all frequencies. There is synchrotron from the galaxy and then, of course, detector noise. And these are big challenges that have to be overcome in order to detect the signal because these uh, foregrounds are many orders of magnitude larger than the signal that we are after. And in principle, what we want is to separate the physics from the astrophysics. We would like to uh, measure the initial conditions from inflation, the nature of the dark matter and dark energy, and separate that from uh, consequences of star formation. And there are three epochs before the first galaxy is formed that redshifts above, let's say, 25. We can map the density fluctuations through the 21 centimeter absorption that I mentioned. Uh, during reionization, we can go after the initial conditions from inflation by trying to map the peculiar velocities uh, by looking at the anisotropy of the power spectrum, as I showed uh, a few slides ago. And after reionization, uh, there are still pockets of residual hydrogen left inside galaxies. And we can use that to map the distribution of galaxies. And right now, uh, we uh, do not have these, this data yet, but the, the goal is to test also gravity by measuring how perturbations grow as a f on small scales that were not probed so far. We can actually test uh, whether gravity follows uh, the linear perturbation equations that I uh, mentioned in my previous lecture. And we can do that over a very wide range of redshifts between 1 and 15. But right now, uh, the situation is analogous to the microwave background research prior to the first detection of a signal. Um, and uh, let me skip on that and, and finally mention uh, one other item which has to do with intensity mapping of other lines. Uh, so not just 21 centimeters, 21 centimeter line, but you can in principle go after other spectral lines that are emitted from galaxies. So, for example, if you imagine a cartoon uh, view of, of the early universe, there is the 21 centimeter line that comes from the hydrogen between the galaxies. Uh, there are these ionized bubbles, the holes, where these are the cavities where you don't find a diffuse hydrogen. Uh, but inside of them, you have galaxies. And galaxies emit uh, spectral lines if they have heavy elements in them. Uh, and, for example, JWS be able to look at individual galaxies, but it will not be able to map the distribution of galaxies on large scales. And one way to do that mapping is to look at the <coughs> spectral lines of those galaxies and map the large scale distribution by doing intensity mapping of the spectral lines emitted by those galaxies on large scales without resolving individual galaxies. You're just looking at the cumulative emission from all these galaxies. 
And that's an illustration of uh, all kinds of lines that are emitted by galaxies, for example, by uh, neutral carbon, by ionized carbon, by neutral oxygen as a function of wavelength. You have multiple lines. Once you produce carbon and oxygen and nitrogen, you uh, get these emission lines from galaxies. And uh, in fact, we observe those lines with the Herschel telescope. Uh, that's a, a star-forming uh, region that shows uh, these lines. And uh, that's a galaxy that shows these lines, ARP220. And uh, that's a, a set of uh, interacting galaxies that show th this line. Um, and we can, in principle, go after intensity mapping of the line. And we develop the methodology to do that. If you use just one line, you cannot tell which line it is, because the line can be emitted uh, by one transition at one redshift or another line uh, transition at a different redshift. So you can't separate the two. But if you look at multiple lines, then you should be able to actually uh, separate and identify which you are talking about. because. At different redshifts, galaxies would not be correlated with each other. So only when you look at the same redshift at multiple lines, you would get correlations between the galaxies. And we showed that the cross-power spectrum of correlating different lines allows you to get rid of uh, uh, spurious uh, uh, misidentification. Um, and okay. yeah. Maybe we might leave something for next. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm almost done. Um, and so that allow you to, in principle, infer the size of ionized bubbles. And uh, let me close with that. Um, the next uh, decade promising is promising to be very exciting. And I described several um, methods that will be used to uh, probe the early universe. Uh, first, uh, using large telescopes, uh, either from the ground or from space, we hope to detect the early galaxies that produced ionizing radiation and ionized um, And of course, uh, we expect the distribution of galaxies to be anti-correlated with the distribution of 21 centimeter brightness fluctuations. And on the theoretical side, right now we, start, we, we are having simulations of reionization that are uh, starting to employ sufficiently large uh, simulation boxes uh, with the necessary uh, resolution to properly identify the small galaxies that form at early times. Thank you. Yes, so um, I did not specify which method you use to map the matter distribution in the universe. But um, the reason that Redshift 10 is uh, the best epoch is simply because um, there is the largest number of small regions that you can probe that are still in the linear regime at that redshift. And one way to do that is using the 21 centimeter line. But you need to be able to resolve those small regions in order to reach the maximum potential of uh, identifying the amplitude of density perturbations. And the statistics also of density perturbations, you can test Gaussianity to a high precision this way. So I think the 21 centimeter method uh, gives us the best hope for being able to, in principle, map matter uh, fluctuations on small scales. Using galaxies to do that is more complicated because uh, you have to assign uh, a bias factor, for example, to galaxies. And there are lots of complicating factors due to the astrophysics. So uh, mainly what I was trying to say in the first part of the lecture is using the 21 centimeter line, uh, we can get a, a wealth of information, much more information about the initial conditions of the universe in principle. Once we are able to demonstrate that we can detect the signal and then build the most powerful experiment that we can, we should be able to get a, a much 
higher statistical confidence in the cosmological parameters than with any other method, including the cosmic microwave background, which probes just the surface, two-dimensional surface, or galaxy surveys, which are limited either by our understanding of galaxy formation or limited by the co-moving volume that we can probe in nearby surveys. So that was my main point. Yes, for non-rotating uh, stars. So the currently, the range of 160 to 240 solar masses <coughs> for pair instability supernovae determined <coughs> for the simple models of those progenitor stars that are non-rotating, do not have magnetic fields, for example. So uh, you have already answered the question. The question is how precise is that known? Right. It's, it's, there is a, a, a limit to the high Right, so in principle, uh, complications can arise due to rotation of the stars, progenitor stars, due to magnetic fields in them. And most importantly, the understanding of the winds that uh, carry mass out of these progenitor stars. So uh, in principle, you can have pair instability supernovae also from stars that do not have uh, extremely low metallicity. And in fact, the, the example that I mentioned, 2007 BI, is in a dwarf galaxy uh, that has a low metallicity, but not extremely low. Uh, and the reason is why, and a, a possible origin for that supernova that we explored with uh, my student Tony Pan is that uh, you make a massive star at the center of a young, dense star cluster. Due to collisions of stars, you build up the mass of the central star, and you make a very massive star of hundreds of solar masses. So even though there, is, there could be mass loss, due to winds carrying, uh, due to a wind carrying off mass from the progenitor, the final mass of the progenitor at the time when the explosion takes place is high enough to result in pair instability. So usually um, uh, the, the wind uh, mass loss rate depends on metallicity. And that's why people preferred to associate such supernova with low metallic environments. But if you make sufficiently massive stars, even with the mass loss due to the wind, you can still end up with a sufficiently massive progenitor after the end of its life so that it will make a parent. And so that's a very natural channel. And we get roughly the correct rate to be consistent with 2007 BI this way. Right, so uh, as of now, we haven't detected examples of pair instability supernova at those high redshifts. And so it's quite possible that uh, there wouldn't be many of them if indeed the mode of star formation that ends up in making stars of uh, hundreds of solar masses uh, was not so prominent uh, based on the latest simulation results as you indicated. Um, so uh, it may well be that uh, it's not easy for us to find pair instability supernovae. So in the example that uh, I showed uh, from the work with Tony Pan, where we predicted that JWC could see such a pair instability supernovae from high redshift, that was under the assumption that uh, population three stars or massive stars make a major contribution to the process of reionization. If you don't put that, then of course you might not see examples of such events uh, with JWST. Uh, but at low redshifts, you could still see them, as I mentioned. If you make a, ma a massive enough star at the center of a star cluster due to collisions of stars, you build up the mass of the star to allow you to get a pair instability. Super the only reason people um, <coughs> associate them with low metallic environments is because the mass loss rate from a progenitor star increases as you increase the metallicity. That's the only reason. But you can make a pair instability supernova with a, a, a high metallic as well. <coughs> 